Okay, can everybody see? Yes, you see the screen, please. Alrighty, so I'm gonna talk about uh, turbulence in wind tunnel test sections. I'll try to go through this pretty quickly so I don't uh, go over time here. So for a typical wind tunnel design, uh, when most people think about wind tunnels, they think about these closed loop wind tunnels. And ideally we always want laminar flow in wind tunnel test sections. Um, unsteady flows can cause transition at unfavorable, unfavorable times and locations on models, which can lead to um, inaccurate measurements of lift and drag and boundary layers and um, other items like that. So we use flow straightening screens and honeycombs to help reduce this turbulence. You can see um, here's some examples of flow straightening screens. You got the honeycombs, circular, square, and a typical closed loop um, wind tunnel. However, there are some benefits of having turbulence in wind tunnels. Um, let me minimize that. Uh, you can have um, environmental wind tunnels are specifically designed to study environmental phenomenon, which you can use them for tornado and hurricane force winds to, t uh, to study snow drifts. Um, they also use them to study sand dune formations. Um, they can also be used to study turbulence in urban settings, um, such as flow through buildings and cities, and they also help design skyscrapers. So here's a picture of an open circuit wind tunnel. You can see it also has kind of the um, honeycomb screens to help straighten the flow, reduce the turbulence. The test section here, it's pulled, the air is pulled through the tunnel by fans, typically at the end of the tunnel. Um, the environmental wind tunnel that WVU has that Dr. Browning acquired um, is set up sort of like this. Um, we have a longer section here, which is what we call the fetch. It helps basically make sure the flow is fully developed by the time it gets to the test section. So how a wind tunnel helped design uh, skyscrapers. So we can think of wind going across the surface of Earth as basically a boundary layer. So as we increase in height, so does the wind loading on buildings. And wind around tall buildings causes vortex shedding, which can put a strain on these buildings and cause a lot of issues such as um, structural damage. Um, you can see here is a picture of a cube and the vortex shedding off of those. So everything has its own oscillating frequency and this can cause a lot of damage to buildings. Uh, you can see this a lot as well in um, like roads, road signs when they oscillate in the wind really hard. So Taipei 101 is located in, in Taipei, China. It was built between 1999 and 2004. It's currently ranked the 10th tallest building in the world at 508 meters or roughly 1600 feet. So Taipei 101 was originally designed to have square corners and you can kind of see it in the picture on the right there. The corners here were originally designed to be just straight squares but they tested a scale model of Taipei 101 in a wind tunnel and it showed like crazy amounts of swaying and oscillations that would end up causing structural damage. So designers then added these sawtooth corners and it actually ended up reducing the movement of the building by 25%. Some other damping methods um, that are really common for tall skyscrapers, uh, buildings can be tapered you can see that in the first picture on the right. Uh, this is the shard in London. They just make them smaller as they go up so that there's less surface area being impacted by the um, wind. Yeah, increase in wind speed as it goes up. You can also have periodic setbacks, which is the second picture on the right there. This is the Willis Tower in Chicago. The periodic set setbacks are kind of like set, uh, steps, which does kind of the same idea as the tapering. It gets smaller as it goes up. Uh, you can have the softening and rounding of corners, which is um, basically the idea that Taipei 101 followed as well, 
You can also see another picture on the bottom left there of a more rounded skyscraper. You can also create holes in these buildings like the Kingdom Center in um, Saudi Arabia. And this literally just takes a giant chunk out of the building at where the, the wind loading would be the strongest. So it would just go straight through the building. Uh, there's also twisting, which is actually really common to see on car antennas. This helps make the wind travel up the antenna or up the uh, curvature of the building in a way so it doesn't shake the building. Uh, finally, there's also damping using um, weights or slosh tanks. And Taipei 101 actually has a weight in their building as well. These are typically put really oh. high up in the buildings and they help dampen the swaying. So for measuring turbulence and wind tunnels, one of the most commonly used oh. methods is a hot wire anemometer. These typically measure the mean velocity, root mean squares, and the turbulence intensity. There's two basic types. You can have a single or an X probe or a cross probe. The single hot wire anemometers um, are normal to the flow and measure velocity in one direction, which is the direction of the mean flow. And for cross probes, they measure both the streamwise and the cross, cross flow velocity components. And here you can see two pictures. This is the um, single and this is a cross. So for constant, temp for constant temperature hot wire anemometers, they take advantage of the fact that the wire resistance is a function of temperature. So air, as air passes the wire in the wind tunnel, the temperature of the wire changes due to convection. And this leads to a resistant change, which also leads then to a voltage difference in the bridge. So the amplifier in the bridge then can detect this difference and adjust this feedback current to keep the wire and resistance at a constant, um, constant, constant measurement. So the measured changes then in the current flow allow for this calculation of the velocity using transfer functions. And then we can find the time averaged velocity at the certain point where the hot wire anemometer is by taking the average of the instantaneous velocity. Uh, using time averaged velocity and instantaneous velocity at that point where the hot wire is in the flow, the fluctuation velocity can be found and subsequently then the root mean squared velocity can also be found. And here you can see the equations like we've discussed in class for um, fluctuation velocity and root mean square velocity. So now we can find the turbulence intensity, which is a fraction of the total energy of the flow, which resides in the turbulence regime. For cross probes, the total turbulence intensity can be found from taking the um, root mean squared velocity divided by your average velocity times 100 for both u direction and v direction, and then squaring, summing those, taking the average, um, and the square root, same for um, the average velocities. This gives you the turbulence intensity in the wind tunnel. And then other parameters that can also be found include the skewness and the flatness or kurtosis of the flow. These are similar to um, the statistical values that we talked about early on in the class. The skewness is measure of the lack of the symmetry in the flow and the flatness is a measure of the amplitude distribution. And there's our equations for um, skewness and kurtosis. Um, another common measurement uh, for turbulence in wind tunnels is a turbulent sphere. This was obviously a lot more common before hot wire anemometers were created. This indirectly measures turbulence intensity by determining the turbulence factor of the wind tunnel which then correlates the effective Reynolds number and the tunnel Reynolds number. So this relies on the sphere drag crisis and the correlation between the critical Reynolds number and the turbulence intensity, where the drag crisis is when drag coefficient on the sphere suddenly drops off due, the, due to the shift in the flow separation point. So the uh, effective Reynolds number in the tunnel is the perceived higher Reynolds number due to the effect of the free stream turbulence in the tunnel. You can see here um, 
the laminar boundary layer separates a lot sooner. But if you have kind of a turbulent boundary layer, it will um, make the wake smaller and separate a lot later on. So, yep, typically we desire smooth laminar flow in wind tunnels, but turbulence can still be very beneficial, such as modeling environmental phenomenons and um, the impacts on urban structures. And the best, mes best, best methods for determining these turbulence factors are hot wire anemometers and turbulence spheres. Any questions? Sorry, I muted myself. So, so thank you very much. It's Good presentation. Any questions from the audience, please? Uh, I have a question. It was on the, I think, second slide. This one or the next one? Yep, this one. Uh, so the flow straightening screen examples, you've got uh, three different ones there. Do you think the honeycomb is the most widely used because it's the best or is it just like the easiest to make? So it is actually the most common used because it is the best. I don't know the actual um, efficiency values of all three of them, but typically honeycombs are used because they are the most efficient at straightening the flow. All right, cool. Thank you. Yep. Okay, more questions, please. Well, that's really nice presentation. And uh, yes, and typically again, one more topic that area people try to consider, it's like buildings and um, also like big vehicles, like big ships, like uh, all this travel line, how they react with turbulence, how it goes. And that's really a very good presentation in terms of skewness and flatness here. I should tell you, well, I never thought about buildings. But I thought about big ships, like, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I had the arguments, this discussion with one of my friends some years ago that I told, let's see, for instance, how aviation developed during one century. So imagine how small planes, yeah, like century ago, and what we have now. It really cannot be compared. Or spacecrafts, <laughs> they didn't exist at that time. But if you compare big, uh, like, ships, uh, if you compare Titanic and what we have now, they're still comparable in terms of velocity, in terms of size. In fact, they're comparable. But he replied to me, no, you don't understand what you say. Because, in fact, it is now that people analyze how to optimize propagation. So they talk about surface area, about shape, how they look like, how they should go. And even when they model new small cars, like, like light duty vehicles, they really investigate. That's really big effect of turbulence. If you change your shape a little bit, it really does modify it. Yeah. Okay, more questions, please. Okay, no more questions, and thank you. Thank you, our speaker again. And it looks like that was the last presentation. So everyone made the talk, right? In my list, everyone is, is there, right? Please recall, if not, if no, somebody did not make it, tell me, please, report. I think everyone. So that's good. And again, uh, ideally, we should have like regular lectures in the class, and these presentations would be some jewels, some kind of break to get rest from uh, formulas. But I'm glad that we have made these presentations two weeks after online classes. So if you don't mind, I will post all these presentations. And I post some of them. Please go to the videos. Please follow it. It's really, it's really nice that we have it. Thank you for this. Again, so okay, so we have a good break. And now we have a long break, three three days. And again, now when we are at home, these breaks are not. We don't feel breaks like before. We don't feel holidays like before. But still, remember, this is the last long weekend because before the end of semester. So please take your time to catch everything, to catch your classes. We still have three weeks to complete everything. And I'm thankful that you keep attending this class by Zoom. And I know online teaching is not like face-to-face, -face, but we still try to do it. And actually also I should share my, and thank you, I should share my personal news that today in the morning I got this outstanding educator award for my teaching. And this is because of evaluation of my students who attend my classes and who write recommendations for me. So some of you did it. I should really thank you for this, for appreciation of my teaching. That's really good, good sign. And uh, I try, again, online it's not like face-to-face, -face, but I try my best. And still, so we still have six lectures and we will proceed on them uh, next week. So uh, stay safe and healthy and I will see you on Tuesday, right?
Okay, any more questions at this point? Uh, if not, then let me write up and thank you for all our presenters. Thank you for today. And again, sorry for delay, we started belatedly because one of my students just got his PhD and became doctor of philosophy, so I had delay today. Thank you. Thank you, I see you on Tuesday.